Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our today's uh, discussion about the World B Day. And uh, we're still admitting some participants, more participants. So in two minutes time, we'll be able to start off. Welcome. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings from Nature Kenya. My name is Richard Kipneno, the boarding and uh, membership officer. And it's a great, great uh, privilege to have you on board uh, today on 20th of May, uh, where we are celebrating the World Be Day 2022. Our theme for the day is uh, Be Engaged, celebrating the diversity of bees and beekeeping system. And we have the privilege today to interact with Dr. Dino Martins as he takes us through uh, this uh, world of bees. So um, thank you and uh, feel very much welcome. I will encourage each and every one of us uh, to remain muted as uh, Dino takes us through a short, uh, a short talk that he has about uh, the bees. And also, uh, thank you very much to all the participants who have been able to forward to us uh, their questions through the email that we provided through all our social media uh, uh, platforms. We already have the questions and they are with the speaker and uh, actually we will prioritize by uh, going uh, through all of them. And should you be having uh, any question, feel free to drop them in the chat box and uh, we will also be able to sample each and every uh, after we are done with the ones that we already have. So uh, also to let you know that we are live in uh, Nature Kenya Facebook page. This is an interactive uh, discussion. Feel free to ask uh, all your concerns that you've been having about, about the bees. So maybe just before I invite uh, our today's uh, speaker, just a quick uh, bio. Uh, Dr. Dino Martins is a renowned entomologist and accomplished naturalist. He has extensive experience of working with farmers in Kenya in relation to bees and pesticides and improving pollinator awareness and conservation. He is a National Geographic emerging explorer and a recipient of the prestigious Whitley Gold Awards. Dr. Dino has also authored several books on insects, our friends, the pollinators, butterflies, children's books, and the recently released grasses of East Africa. And maybe he's also working on something else. Maybe you let us know after this. So uh, thank you very much and uh, feel very much welcome. Let me welcome on stage Dr. Dino Martins to give us a short talk, and then we go straight to the questions that we already have. Welcome, Dr. Dino. Thank you. Thank you so much for welcoming me, and uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to join you today and to talk a little bit about bees. Uh, we are very excited that it's World Bee Day. 
Kenya is one of those countries that's very blessed with in, incredible bee diversity, and we have over a thousand species that occur in Kenya. Uh, I have a small presentation. I'll try and see if I can share it. Uh, sorry, no, I'm to do that. Apologies, we'll get, there we go. So I, I believe you, everyone can see that. Oh, sorry, sorry, we've gone to the end of it. So what we're, we're talking about bees today, and I'm going to talk a little bit on how, how to be a bee and how we can learn a little bit more about them. This is a wonderful picture here I took up in Lycipia of a, uh, this is a bee, a longhorn bee that's visiting the flowers of a little wildflower. It's called Orthosiphon. It's related to Plecthranthus. And these are one of the bees that appear now after the rains that are very common in our dryland areas. But even though it looks like a honeybee, it's actually a solitary bee. And so one of the things about bees is everybody knows bees, but they know about honeybees. Honeybees are just one species, one species of bee called Apis mellifera. And honeybees are social, as we know, they live in a colony. And that colony is like a family. So just like, like humans live in families, honeybees also live in a family, but it's slightly differently structured from a human family. So if we think about honeybees, they have a very organized and very sophisticated family structure where you have a queen. Uh, you can see here is an illustration of a queen and she is laying eggs that are then hatching into larvae which are tended by worker honeybees. Now, the amazing thing about honeybee families is it's dominated by females. You have mainly uh, worker females and the queen, and occasionally those eggs that hatch into larvae will develop into drones, which are males. And the remarkable thing with bees, bees, ants, and wasps is that when eggs are fertilized, they become females, either workers or queens in the case of the honeybees, but unfertilized eggs become males. So honeybees uh, and other members of the ant, bee and wasp order have this very unusual thing called haplodiploid. So it's a really remarkable genetic system. So one of the questions that always comes up about honeybees is, you know, where do the queens come from? You know, how, if we have this unusual system of fertilized eggs becoming females and unfertilized eggs becoming males, how do you get queens? And the answer is really amazing and it'll, it'll surprise all of us. Well, what happens with those larvae? The female larvae, if they are fed a special substance called royal jelly, which is a very valuable substance that people can harvest, it's a, it's a mixture of very concentrated nutrients and hormones and other uh, organic compounds that is produced by the bees. When those larvae are fed royal jelly, that's what turns them into future queens. And it's really amazing. So these virgin queens will grow in the hive on special cells. You can see one of those queen cells here. And then eventually at a particular moment in time, out will hatch the queens and they will fly out of the colony chased by the drones, the males who also hatch at the same time, and they fly straight up into the sky up to a kilometer, even two kilometers high. And that's where the mating takes place. And so each queen will mate with multiple males. As they mate, the males die. The queen returns back to the hive where she was born. And then there's two possible scenarios. Either she replaces the old queen or the colony will actually split and half of them will stay with the old queen and half of them will go so that's the amazing thing about honeybees, which are just the one species, the species we're most familiar with. The reason we're so familiar with honeybees is because here in East Africa, we have an incredible ancient relationship with bees. Many, many different communities have a tradition of honey harvesting as well as of beekeeping. 
here we can see a mze who's in the Mokogodo forest, which is in, in like Kipia North. That forest is an ancient forest and the people that live there have practiced beekeeping for many generations. We can see here a traditional hive. So the way most people have kept bees is using traditional log hives, which is a hollowed out log, and then the bees come and live in it. Uh, this style of beekeeping is, is very, very ancient. It goes back for, for a long period of time, but the relationship between bees and humans is even older than that. We have been engaging with bees and harvesting honey and benefiting from honeybees for, for many, many thousands, even millions of years. One other amazing thing about bees in East Africa is people don't just keep honeybees, they also can keep stingless bees. Here's a mama at, in Mount Meru in Tanzania. And you can see she has some beehives right by her house and she's holding the hive. Now, most of us who, who are involved in beekeeping, we would not be able to go up to a hive and touch it like without any protective gear or smoking the bees because the bees would be aggressive. Honeybees can be aggressive and they can sting. But this is a very interesting example of stingless bees. Stingless bees, are uh, many different species of bees that are related to honeybees, but a diff different species. And they also produce honey. And there's also an ancient tradition of both harvesting them and keeping, keeping them as well. And so not so many people have the knowledge anymore, but stingless beekeeping is an important aspect of human engage engagement with bees. Now, when, when we think about bees, bees have many different needs. But just like people, they need food and water. They also need a place to live. So bees get their food primarily from flowers in the form of nectar. They also collect pollen. And then they get water when they go to drink from places that have water, either the edges of streams or other places. And so this is a really important part of both keeping honeybees as well as conserving bees in general. Bees need to have access to adequate flowers, including wildflowers and flowering trees like we can see in the middle here. There's a picture of a honeybee visiting the flowers of Acacia mellifera. And Acacia mellifera is one of the plants that grows in the drylands of Kenya and produces some of the finest honey that we know of. It's extremely creamy and rich. And we hasty. That's a plant so in beekeeping, both stingless bee and honey beekeeping, we have honey as one of the main products that we're familiar with. And as you can see here, here are some of the honeys that are produced in Kenya. We have got the Arabuko Sokoke forest honey, which uh, you can get at the Nature Kenya office in Nairobi and it's widely supplied and distributed. But beekeeping is a very, very important economic activity for many, many millions of people. Right now, the amazing thing is the demand for honey is so high in Kenya that we actually have a deficit in our honey production. Mo we have a significant amount of honey that's imported and that's that's ridiculous because we could actually produce that honey here. So honey is being imported in Kenya and being sold where, because we can't actually meet the demand from our own domestic production. So there's a great opportunity here to increase the amount of honey available through better beekeeping. Uh, and I'll point out in the middle here are two stingless bee honeys. We've got these from Kakamega Forest from actually two different stingless bee species. So stingless bee honey is also widely consumed and traded more at a local level rather than commercially, but it's a very important part of people's nutrition and health and the knowledge around stingless beekeeping is really important to protect as well. So we've talked about honeybees and stingless bees. I wanted to introduce you now to the diversity of bees. Here are just a few of those over a thousand species that live in East Africa, in Kenya. We have a longhorn bee, the bee that we met at the beginning of the talk, up here on the, on the top left of the screen. On the right here is a stingless bee, a meliponula. This is a Kakamega forest. Down below, you can see a bee that's visiting a bright yellow flower. 
and you notice that it's got a lot of pollen on its abdomen. This is a leaf cutter bee. So leaf cutter bees are in the family, the Megachylidae, and they carry pollen on their abdomen. So they carry it actually underneath their body. Honeybees, as we know, transport pollen on their hind legs. They have the pollen baskets, as do stingless bees. And then on the bottom right of your image are, are two bees. You can see one is an amagilla bee and one is a longhorn bee. These are both males. So what's interesting with the solitary bees, who are the two bees here in the lower photos, is that the females have nests that they live in that are solitary. They are alone in that nest with their eggs and larvae. But the males, once they've hatched out, they don't have a nest. So you'll often find them sleeping on grass stems and cl clustering together, looking for places to be safe. So bees are really, really important as pollinators. And of those thousand species of bees that we have in Kenya, every single one is an important pollinator. And when we think about the production of crops, many different crops that we grow are very, very dependent on bee pollination. So crops like the co like coffee and avocado, the pigeon pea, which is the one illustrated here with, with a carpenter bee visiting it, the cow peas, eggplants, lentils, all of the nuts, all of the melons, many of our vegetables that we grow from seed as well as many traditional vegetables are pollinated by bees as well as other pollinators. So bees and pollinators are responsible for 80% of all flowering plants depend on these pollinating insects. And one in three bites of food is thanks to a pollinator. So we really owe a lot to bees and other pollinators in terms of providing this free service from nature for us to benefit from through our food. This is a picture of a bee that looks like a honeybee, but it's actually a bee called Nomia. It's one of the solitary bees. And you can see it's visiting the flower that many of you will be familiar with. This is the flower of a Solanaceae, of Solanum. So this family of plants have a very interesting mechanism of pollination. They actually have, a, the bee has to hold the flower. It grabs it in a particular way and then it, it shakes it very vigorously by transferring energy from its wing muscles into the flower. So it's called buzzing. And if you watch bees visiting these flowers, you'll actually be able to hear that high pitched buzz. At that point where the anthers are, because they are enclosed inside this chamber, they are vibrated very, very vigorously and pollen is released. And so what this bee is doing in this picture is now she's lifted back up into the air and you can see on her hind legs, she's wiping the pollen to carry this pollen in her pollen basket. So really many bees have these intricate relationships with flowers where their behavior is also linked to that of the morphology and of the flower. So I'm just gonna end the, this part of the talk by showing you a couple of posters that we've produced. Here are bees at Kakamega Forest. Kakamega is one of the most important forests in Kenya. We have uh, many different aspects of diversity there, and we have over 200 bee species have been found at Kakamega Forest. We can see here different bees, the honey bees, the stingless bees. We have, we've got uh, long face bees. We've got in the middle number 25 and 26 show you a very special bee, Tinoplectra, that goes to flower, particular flowers, the Momodica flowers, to collect oils. It doesn't collect um, uh, pollen and nectar. In this case, it collects the oils from the flower, which are a special reward that has evolved from those plants. So Kakamega forest, which we know for diversity, has over 200 species of bees. But what is remarkable, if is, I'll show you the last slide here, is the bees of Turkana. Now we know Turkana as a dry land ecosystem. We, we with uh, you know right now a, a very stressed ecosystem because of the drought. But Turkana and the dry lands of Kenya, whether it's Turkana 
or Masabit or Samburu or Mandera, Wajia into Savo down to the coast, these are the most bee rich habitats of Kenya. They have incredible diversity of bees. On a single tree in flower, an acacia, you could find up to 50 different diff species of bees visiting at one point in time. And we've been uh, describing the bees from Turkana. We're now up to over 700 different species, morpho species that we found in Turkana. So incredible diversity. Many of these species are still being described by scientists. Most of the species are solitary. They're not social like honeybees or stingless bees. They're solitary bees that live alone in a nest, usually in the soil or in, in vegetation. And then they have their life cycle that is very much linked to rains and flowering. And why are so, bees are so diverse in these drylands? Because what happens in deserts is the patchiness of the habitat and the fact that bees are dependent on collecting pollen and nectar for their food. This is very much more effective in dry habitats. In wet habitats, that food tends to get mold and fungi and yeasts that infect it. But in these dry areas, bees are able to store that food much more effectively. So they have diversified much more in dry areas, in hot, dry areas, in deserts, basically, than they have in forests. So uh, these are just two of the posters which you can get from Nature Kenya. And there's also uh, as I just end here, stop sharing, and I will close that. So the other thing that I'd like to show you is there's a book on pollinators that we've produced that has a lot of information about bee diversity and pollinator diversity. It's available freely online. We can share the link with you or you can get a copy from Nature Kenya. So thank you. I'll pause there and see if there are any questions that anyone would like to, to ask. Wow. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dino, for that um, insight about bees. Never knew that we have over 1,000 species of bees in Kenya. Thank you very much for that. So I see in the chat box, we have uh, quite a good number of questions that have already come in. So maybe before we get there, we can start by handling the first uh, questions that uh, came in before. Uh, and I will go straight to the first question. Over the years, the world has been witnessing a decline in bee populations. Should we be concerned about this? And if so, why? Thank you, that's a very important question. Yes, we are seeing declines in certain bees. For example, the honeybees in Europe and North America have been collapsing. Their populations are really declining. Uh, in other parts of the world, other bees are also declining and it's really due to human activities, farming with pesticides, you know, destroying natural habitat, charcoal burning, sand harvesting. These are all activities that affect bees very, very significantly. So we should be concerned because our future in terms of obtaining food and nutrition is really linked to bees and pollinators, but most habitats. So even in the pastoralist areas, animals are eating plants and many of those plants, for example, camels, camels feed on hundreds of different species of plants and they're very important for communities in Northern Kenya and the Horn of Africa. Those plants are dependent on pollinators. So where for humans, we say one in three bites of food is thanks to a pollinator. For the camel, we might even say nine out of 10 bites of food is thanks to a pollinator. So we should really protect uh, and nurture pollinators and bees wherever we can. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, the second question is more linked to the first one. What are the major causes of the bees population decline? And how bad is the situation here in Kenya and in Africa generally? Thank you. That's a very good question. So many different things are affecting bees. The one is agriculture and the use of chemicals, pesticides. 
uh, that is, has a huge impact on bees because it directly poisons and kills them. Pesticides are designed to kill insects and as bees are insects, if they are exposed to pesticides, they will be affected. But many other activities also impact bees. When we clear natural habitat or when we cut down trees, for example, to burn charcoal, uh, that destroys the foraging plants for bees and their sources of food. It also destroys the habitats that some of these bees might be nesting in. Sand harvesting and uh, land degradation is another aspect that affects bees because it, it is really destroying the places that ground nesting bees will be living in. And from those two posters I showed earlier, the vast majority of those bees, of solitary bees, are actually nesting in the ground. So if we are disturbing those areas, then that will affect them. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Uh, another question, do all bees produce honey? That's a good question. So the answer is no, all bees do not produce honey. So the only bees that produce honey are the honey bees, as we call them, and we know them, and the stingless bees. These are bees that are part of the family Apidae, and they have evolved this social structure. So they live in these colonies. And part of that is storing food. So it's really amazing. Honeybees will travel, you know, many, many distances, visit millions of flowers to collect nectar to produce honey. The same with the stingless bees. And most other bees, most diversity of bees do not produce honey. What they do is they visit flowers, they collect nectar and pollen, they mix it together. They'll make something called, it looks like a little bee loaf and that is what they put in their solitary nests for their larvae to feed on. So bees are collecting food, whether it's nectar or pollen, to, to provide for their larvae as well as their own energy needs. But only a few of them produce honey. Most bees do not make honey. Oh, thank you for that. Apart from honey, what other products do we derive from bees and what are they used for? So honeybees produce a number of products. We have royal jelly, which is the special substance, as I'd mentioned, that's produced by bees to nurture the queen larvae. So that is harvested in very special ways. It's used in, in the nutrition industry. It's used in pharmaceuticals. It's considered, it's a very, very concentrated form of nutrients, basically, including some hormones, including minerals that the bees have selected and put in there. And so the other things that honeybees produce are bees wax, which is the wax that they produce from glands to build the combs on which they store their honey. And bees wax is a very valuable product. It can be used in cosmetics. It's used for making candles. If you visit the Nature Kenya offices, you can see some products that are sometimes made from bees wax. Or if you go to a farmer's market, you'll see candles and other products made from bees wax. In addition to that, there are two other things we get from honeybees. One is the propolis. So this is a very sticky substance. You'll see bees use it to line parts of their hives, to seal off gaps. And it is made from the bees gathering resin and waxes and other plant products, mixing it with some of their own glandular secretions, and then creating this very dense, very dark mixture. Propolis is also now used medicinally and it's, all, it's used in many different uh, pharmaceutical and therapeutic products. And the last thing that honeybees give us, when they sting us, we know that sting is very painful and they inject some venom. Well, it turns out that venom, as much as it's painful, the actual venom itself is very useful medicinally and it's very, very valuable. So there are actually people that take bees, honeybees, and harvest the venom to, to use in medicinal products. And it's, it's very carefully harvested. Because if you just take a bee, a honeybee to sting, of course, once it stings you, the sting breaks off. That's to alarm and warn its other bees. But you don't want to do that. You don't want to kill the bee. So harvesting venom is done in very special places where they allow the bee to sting without it breaking off the sting and so then they can keep harvesting venom from those bees. Thanks. Wow, thank you.
the next question, I think you handled it before. Somebody was asking, do all these sting? That's, that's a great question. So we've heard about the stingless bees. Obviously, those have lost the ability to sting. So they no longer have a functional sting. But for all other bees, do they sting? The answer is yes. But not all bee stings because it's only females that sting. Same for wasps, same for ants. The sting in the ants, bees, and wasps is a modified part of the ovipositor, the egg-laying device. And since only females lay eggs, only females can sting. Male bees cannot sting. You can pick up a male bee and you can hold them in your hand and you can, you can beat them and they still won't be able to do anything. Males cannot sting. So only female bees and wasps can sting. Thank you. Another question, what is Kenya's potential for beekeeping? Kenya's potential for beekeeping is, is tremendous. Nature Kenya works with many different communities across Kenya through the site support groups and other people living around important habitats, the important bird areas, the important biodiversity areas. And beekeeping is providing a livelihood for millions and millions of Kenyans and other people across East Africa. Kenya has a great potential to increase the amount of beekeeping, but it, we have to do it in a way that is sustainable. Because when we think of bees, we should think of honeybees as livestock. Remember, bees are all that diversity that we have out there, a thousand species or more in Kenya. So honeybees will compete with other bees, with wild bees. So where we put hives, we should ensure that we're doing it in a way that is in, in harmony with that local environment. Let us not overstock, just like we can overstock with livestock, we can overstock with honeybees as well. And so honeybees are an important part of livelihoods and producing honey, but we need to manage them carefully. And when we manage honeybees, we should also provide and make sure that they have enough food. So that's enough flowers, wildflowers or trees, but they also need water. Water is one of the most critical things for bees to access, to be successful and to be healthy. So if you're keeping honeybees in a hive, you can provide a bowl of water with some gravel or sand or stones in it, and it should be clean water that the bees can go and drink from, because that drinking water, especially in hot, dry areas, is really critical for the success of honeybees. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. The next question, are all pesticides harmful to bees? Uh, that's, that's a good question. It's a complicated question in, in that, yes, all pesticides may have an impact on bees. Some bees will react to them more than others. So honeybees or versus solitary bees versus stingless bees versus carpenter bees, it depends on their own biology. So it also depends how and where they access the pesticide. But pesticides do kill bees and we need to use them very, very carefully. Make sure you read the instructions on the label if you're using pesticides. And before you use a pesticide, try and act, um, find alternatives, whether it's through integrated pest management or using another product that might be less toxic to bees. But remember, even the botanical extracts like neem will affect bees, so you need to use them carefully. Uh, and responsibly. And the key thing is not to spray when bees are flying or foraging or visiting flowers or pollinating the crops, so that you actually get uh, to use the pesticide very selectively only when the pest is there and try and avoid using it when the pollinators are present. Oh, thank you for that answer. Uh, before venturing into beekeeping, should I consider targeting a particular species? So beekeeping is really focused on honeybees and to a lesser extent on stingless bees. Within honeybees, there are different varieties. For most of Kenya, we have what we call the common honeybee or the African lowland honeybee, which is Apis mellifera scutellata. That's a subspecies. When we go to the high altitude areas like Mount Kenya, the Aberdares, Kinangop, some parts of Cherengani, Mount, Mount Elgin, 
these are areas that have another different subspecies, the mountain honeybee, which is Apis mellifera monticola. In some of the far northern dry areas, there are some other subspecies of honeybee. So the key thing is, if you're becoming going into beekeeping, is to understand what are the bee subspecies in your area, if it's high altitude versus other parts of the country, and then talking to local beekeepers, to the wazir who might have some knowledge about them, and making sure you do that in the right way that you design your, your beekeeping in that is it's sensitive and it's connected to your your local environment thanks thank you are there quick remedies for bee stings <laughs> <laughs> so yes the first thing is if a bee a honey bee stings you the sting breaks off now that's a mechanism that's an adaptation from the behavior of these bees the bee, honeybee worker that stings, she dies. When that sting breaks off, it pulls out of her body and she will die. Why is she sacrificing her life through a sting? It's she releases an alarm pheromone as that sting is pulled into the body and it warns other bees. So that's, as you know, if one bee stings you, you have to run away because other bees will come and sting as well. So it's alerting other bees. So the key thing is if you get stung by a honeybee, is to immediately remove that sting and throw it away and wash the area and move away from the place where you were stung because otherwise other bees will have detected the pheromone and they will come and sting you. That's why we have incidents of livestock or even people being attacked by bees. It's because of the trigger of one sting through the alarm pheromone that triggers these other bees to come and attack. It's, a, it's an adaptation to protect themselves and protect their colony. Now, if other bees sting you, it's very rare that you'll be stung by a solitary bee unless you're holding it or you're uh, in contact with it, but they can sting multiple times. So they don't have the mechanism of the sting breaking off. But in the all cases of any sting, the first thing to do is to, is to wash the area and apply something cold, some ice if you have it, or just some cold water or a wet towel, and then stay cool and calm, you know, stay hydrated, should you start having a reaction, some people are allergic to stings, you should think about looking for an antihistamine or seeking some medical advice. Thank you very much. Another question, what if there are no bees in our planet? We can't imagine a world without bees. If there were no bees, there'll be, there'll be no people. No bees, no people, because we need the bees. Bees are such an integral part of our ecosystem and our, our food production systems and every other aspect of our, our habitat. So we, we need bees. Thank you. Another one, do bees residing naturally in tree holes underground tend to be more aggressive than the ones in modern beehives? And do both residences have an implication on the quality of honey? All right, so there are two questions there. One is, do bees in particular places, are they more aggressive? These are honeybees that are living in colonies. So the answer is, it depends on the size of the colony. And the, generally, the larger the colony in the wild, the more aggressive they will be to defend themselves. And honeybees in Africa have really evolved a lot of defensive behaviors because they are targeted by many different creatures, including honey badgers, honey buzzards. We have other species that will go after the bees to grab the honey and humans. And this has been going on for a long time. So those bees have developed those aggressive behaviors in response to these attacks upon their colonies. So if you keep bees in hives, and you're a good beekeeper, there are many practices to limit aggression by bees. So approaching them quietly, wearing the right kind of clothing, using ways of gently handling them. And the longer you do that, bees will actually become less aggressive. Uh, putting on a super on a hive allows you to take away honey and harvest it without disturbing the larvae and the other parts of the colony. So the bees will also be less likely to become very aggressive than when you start destroying the colony. So one important thing that we, we must address is wild harvesting of honey. 
wild harvesting of honey, which has been done by humans for millions of years, is an important part of our history, but it's not sustainable. With the huge population we have now and the habitats under stress, wild harvesting is not sustainable and it's causing a lot of destruction of habitats. Every year you will see forest fires, you'll see fires in Mount Kenya and the Aberdares, largely caused by wild harvesting of honey and large areas and trees that are hundreds of years old will be destroyed by people seeking just a little bit of honey. We should, we should not do that, it's not sustainable and it's destroying both habitat and bees. What we should do instead is beekeeping, which is something that anyone can do if you have a bit of space or a farm or access to, to a place you can do this. And that is much better than wild harvesting honey. Oh, great. Uh, is it safe to have beekeeping in a conservancy where we have wild, wild wildlife? Yes. Uh, it's beekeeping is very compatible with wildlife conservation it just has to be well managed and well designed so that the bees are the hives are protected from disturbance and that they're kept in a place that's shady that has access to natural resources in terms of water and flowers and bees will go out and forage uh, naturally if they have the opportunity to do so so the key thing is designing it in a way that is sensitive both to wildlife and people and protecting the bees as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, how can we transfer how, how can we transfer bees already on trees within the conservancy to the beehives? So it's better not to try and transfer wild colonies. If you set up hives and they're well designed, natural swarms will come and use them. And there are many traditional ways of attracting swarms. Some people use certain plants like osimum. Other people will mix a bit of honey with a particular flower and smear it inside the hive that will attract hives. So normally when the rains arrive, there are natural swarms that are going around. Remember, we talked about the bee life cycle. So when the young queen returns to the colony, either she replaces the old queen or the colony splits and the one of the groups that split will have to go look for a new hive to live in. So if there's a hive available and the bees come in and they find that it's clean and it's safe, they will immediately take up residency there. Hey, thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Dino. Those were the advanced questions that had already reached us uh, prior to this particular day. And uh, I check in the chat box and I really see a lot of interaction there. So we'll also go through each and every uh, comment that has already been uh, raised. I see, uh, okay, Bernard has already shared uh, Dino's contact info. If anyone is interested, maybe in reaching to him later on, the email is there. Uh, Felicity Mecha, lovely. Jay Mutuku, I love this, so educative, thank you. And uh, there's a question from Juliet. Are the benefits of honey from stinging and stingless bees similar? And how can someone notice genuine honey? Uh, thank you, that, that's a very important question. So honey from stingless bees and honey from honeybees is very different. Uh, the stingless bee honey tends to be much darker with a much stronger flavor. It's produced in much smaller volumes typically. And if you go to the traditional communities that use it, they will use that honey in different ways, sometimes for particular medicinal uses, like for respiratory problems versus the honey that comes from honeybees. But in both cases, the honey from stingless bees out or from honeybees is dependent on the nectar and the pollen that the bees fed on. So for example, with bees in the drylands, when they visit acacia mellifera flowers, the wait a bit thorn, that honey is very, very creamy and it's very pale in color, it's very fragrant. When bees go to certain other plants, for example, if they visit croton, that produces a very different honey that's much darker. If they visit euphorbias when they're flowering, that honey is actually almost bitter because some of those compounds from the euphorbia end up in the honey. 
people will use that honey not for consumption, but almost the, for other things like as an antiseptic for wounds or for treating skin problems or for solving other problems medicinally. So the way that honey is formed is very connected to the nectar and pollen that the bees are gathering. Now this connection between bees and the environment is really interesting. So some years ago, we found a case of there were antibiotics in honey. And I noticed a question about the genuine honey that was asked. So this is a big problem. because And the way we discovered, we went down to look at this site. The bees, we couldn't figure out where they were getting these antibiotics, because obviously people are not feeding the bees antibiotics as they do in some places. And eventually we found the bees were visiting a, a clinic where people were being prescribed antibiotics and next to the clinic was a urinal. And so this was a very dry area. And so the bees were going to drink at this place next to this clinic. And that's how the antibiotics, because the people were consuming the antibiotics in, in the going to the, to the urinal and that's where the antibiotics were going into the honey. So bees are very sensitive and very connected to the environment. So the issue of genuine versus fake honey, uh, you can, if you know honey well, you can tell it apart. You can tell it by the fragrance and texture. So yes, there is a lot of fake honey uh, out there that people are mixing syrup uh, with to sugar to make honey, uh, which is more, it's a syrup, it's not a honey. And unfortunately, this is quite common because as I said, the demand for honey is far greater than the supply. And so some of the honey is imported into Kenya and some of that honey is not genuine honey. The best way to get genuine honey, go to the Nature Kenya office and buy it from them directly from the beekeepers or get to know your local beekeeper and farmer's market and purchase it from them. Then you know you're getting genuine honey. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dino. Uh, there's another question from uh, Felicity. I would love to know about bee diseases. Which that's, are, a, that's yeah. a good question. That's a complicated question because bees, honeybees do suffer from diseases. Just like people can get sick, honeybees can get sick. There, there are too many diseases to talk about uh, here because of time, but we have diseases uh, that are caused by viruses and there are diseases that are caused by bacteria, and there are diseases that are caused by fungi. So bees can suffer from all those different diseases. Uh, some of the ones like the diseases that are caused by fungi or bacteria, there are different ways that bees themselves will naturally respond. Uh, and also as a beekeeper, you can learn to recognize them and make sure that the bees are healthy. A healthy colony will not get sick, just like a healthy person if they're eating a diverse, healthy diet and they're getting good exercise and they're living a healthy life, then just same thing for honeybees is if they are healthy, they themselves can fend off diseases. In addition to diseases in Kenya, we'll also see certain parasites like the wax moth or the hive beetle that will go into, the, into beehives. Again, they tend not to impact the healthy colonies. So if we see these parasites, it's a sign that the bees are not healthy. Maybe they're not getting enough water or they're not foraging enough or they're in a place where they're being exposed to some chemicals in the environment or they are stressed by, the, by high temperatures. So there's different ways you can address these, but the key thing is making sure your bees are in a healthy hive, that they have adequate access to clean water, that they can forage efficiently on wildflowers and trees and shrubs, and the healthy colony will be able to defend itself against parasites as well as against diseases. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, John and Margaret Cooper, greetings to all from Norfolk, England. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, Christine, I like this very educative. Do bees cause diseases to human? Is it related to microbial diseases? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last question. 
Okay, uh, Christine is asking, I like this very educative. Do bees cause, cause diseases to humans? Is it related to microbial diseases? Uh, thank you. No, bees do not cause diseases to humans. Honeybees and all bees are uh, not vectors of diseases. They are wild insects or managed insects that are just part of the environment. There's no link to diseases. Some people are allergic to honeybee stings, but that is an individual allergy. It's not a disease. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, Bernard, I've already shared uh, the link to the pollinator handbook by Dr. Dino Martins. You can uh, check on that. Okay, Jay Mutuku, this royal jelly seems strange. What uses has it to humans and what would happen if one was fed the same? So royal jelly is, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a, a, a substance that the bees secrete, the worker honeybees secreted it's actually produced from special glands that they have it's mixed together to form this uh, very dense concentration of nutrients of hormones of minerals and it is put into these special cells where the queen or future queen larvae are contained so it's like they're enclosed inside this and that's what they feed on and they develop and grow so when it's used for humans, it's also, it's an extremely concentrated form of nutrition. Harvesting it though requires very special techniques that most beekeepers don't do. So you have to be able to know when and where to do it. And that's why it is so expensive. It's used as an extremely rich supplement uh, for humans. So if you go to buy royal jelly in a health food store, you'll find it costs a lot of money because it is such a concentrated form of nutrition. But it's, it's bees are not producing it for us, they're producing it for their queen larvae in their hives. Thank you. From RISPA Assembo, what is the most effective individual action everyone should take to save bees? Thank you, RISPA. That's a very wonderful question. So the first thing we can do is choosing where we engage with the environment, learning about bees, learning about the diversity of bees and insects around us, appreciating them, making space in our hearts for them so that we love them and we understand them and we connect with them. But there's also a lot of practical things we can do. We can choose to get food from local farmers, from organic farmers, from responsible farmers that are growing things, whether it's passion fruit or mangoes or nuts, we can buy and support local farmers as well as pollinators. If we are farming ourselves, we can use pesticides more carefully or not use them at all if, they, if we have the option to do that and making sure we're looking after the environment. We can plant trees and shrubs and wildflowers that are beneficial to and attract bees. But, and, but for me, the most important thing is to understand, first of all, that bees are in Kenya are very diverse. There's many different bees, even here in, in Nairobi, or if you go to the museum, you will find you know, different species of bees uh, and learn about them. And one of the things I'm working on is a book to the bees of East Africa, which we hope to finish before the end of this year which will get people excited about the diversity, all those many different hundreds of species of bees. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, from our Facebook um, live stream, you see Janet Kiahon Ismail. She's saying uh, watching from Malawi and she is a bee farmer. Thank you very much. Uh, from Matilda Gikonyo. Hi Dino, thanks for the wonderful presentation. I have two related questions. One, are bees used commercially for pollination in Kenya? In other words, is mel meliponiculture and apiculture integrated with agriculture in Kenya? Two, what causes bees to become feral and how common is this occurrence? Thank you. Thank you, Matilda, for that question. So the answer is, Yes, bees are honeybees are now being used commercially to pollinate some crops. We have farmers that are growing certain crops like runner bean and courgettes in greenhouses, 
that have started using honeybees in Naivasha. So there's some beekeeping specifically being done, not just for honey production, but for commercial pollination services. Now, in many parts of the world, the, because of the disappearance of, of the native bees, people have to bring in bees in hives or other managed ways to pollinate their crops. So, and it costs a lot of money. If you're in New York, for example, growing apples in upstate New York, you will rent a beehive for pollination and pay almost $150 per hive, which is very expensive, you can see. So what we should do in Kenya is value that we have a lot of bee diversity that's naturally there, figure out ways to encourage bees to visit farms and flowers, create spaces of natural habitat, and we have it for free. So we've been taking that for granted and not many farmers can afford to rent hives. So we would better look after our natural bee diversity our honeybees as well, and all our other pollinators because they're doing that service for free. So for the question of meliponiculture and apiculture being integrated. So first of all, meliponiculture means the keeping of stingless bees and apiculture means the keeping of honeybees. There are many places they are being integrated with agriculture because there are certain crops. For example, if we think about sunflowers, which produce sunflower seeds and sunflower oil, a very important crop. And then canola, which is another crop that's now being grown. Those oil seed crops are really dependent on pollination. And the amount of oil in the seed is related to the amount of pollination done by the bees. So integrating beekeeping in those crops is really important. Other crops like avocado or mango or coffee or watermelons are the quality of that crop. So it's not just the, um, the yield, but actually the quality. So when you get a watermelon that has really dense, dark, rich flavor, that's because it took 3000 grains of pollen from different species of bees making many, many, many visits to the female flower because they have separate male and female flowers and watermelons to create that fruit. So it's, it's important to, to do that. So the last question, which is what causes bees to come be feral? So only honey, we don't need to apply this to honeybees. Honeybees will sometimes swarm. That's a natural part of their behavior. So swarming is a natural thing. And it's fairly common after good rains and good conditions. And it's the natural way colonies are spreading. And so putting up other hives will allow you to sort of track those colonies when that behavior is ongoing. Thank you very much. Uh, from Alfin Odwar, considering the climate crisis we are facing currently globally, what policy frameworks have been set in place to protect our natural pollinators from human and other related challenges? Thank you. Um, Nature Kenya has been at the forefront of working on many different policies for biodiversity conservation. And Nature Kenya has an, uh, an environmental legislation and policy working group, specifically for pollinators and for bees. They are covered within the biodiversity aspects of our legal system, but there is also a honeybee policy that's been developed that we've presented to the Ministry of Agriculture and the minister that is being implemented. But the key thing is that we, we really must raise public awareness about bees about the importance of bees, the diversity of bees. Bees are not just honeybees. They are all those many hundreds of species and all of them need to be conserved and protected. So because bees are more diverse in dry land areas, it's critical that we understand the diversity in those dry lands and we also protect those areas. Some, many of which are not formally protected. But the wonderful thing is now with the growth of conservancies in Kenya, especially community conservancies, those community conservancies in the many different dry land areas, there are over 200 of them across the country. They're protecting about 12% of the country's land area, and they're one of the richest habitats for bees in Kenya. Thank you. Uh, from Gregory, hi. How can someone deal with the issue of honey crystallization? Thank you, Gregory. That is a natural process because the sugar molecules will 
form long chains. All you can do is put that jar in a warm, sunny place or put it in a bowl of warm water and that will stop the crystallization. But crystallization is just a natural process of sugars forming the chain molecules within the honey and then it becomes more solid. So it's, it's a natural process. There's nothing to worry about there. Okay. Uh, another question from Peter, very informative. Question one, how do you control wax moths? It is a challenge in many apiaries. Question two, why are bees classified under the livestock department and not wildlife department? Are bees wild or domestic? And the last question, are there surfaces that have studied presence of pesticides in honey? <laughs> So wax moths are one of the wild species that we have. They do parasitize bees, but they are part of the ecosystem. There are two species that are common, the greater and the lesser. One is slightly bigger than the other one. So managing them is a challenge. They generally come into a colony when the colony is weak. And normally, if it's a strong, healthy colony, their bees will, the honeybees will be able to fight off the wax moths and they will naturally try and stop them from coming in. So what the wax moths do is they lay their eggs in the hive and the caterpillars go out and start weaving webs and eating the, the comb, uh, in affecting the larvae, eventually destroying the whole colony. If you detect wax moths, the only way to control them is to completely clean and sterilize that hive, remove all the comb and burn it or destroy it because the eggs will be in there and you, you need to clean it completely and then clean the hive and, and then when a new swarm or a new group of bees come, of honeybees comes in, that will be free of wax moths. For the classification of bees as livestock, well, bees are livestock, honeybees are livestock because the ones they are managed by people, they are kept in hives, those are livestock. They, honeybees that are kept in hives, they belong to somebody. So they have an owner, just like a goat or a cow or a camel or a sheep. So where honeybees are kept and managed, they are livestock. So they are covered under the agricultural side of the policies and, and that, those aspects. Remember, though, as we've said, most bees are wild species. There's over a thousand species in Kenya. Those are part of our wild biodiversity. And in Kenya, we also have wild colonies of honeybees. So Apis mellifera, the honeybee, occurs both as a domesticated honeybee kept in colonies by beekeepers, but some of it occurs as wild. And so those ones would be considered part of the wild species. And the last question was about surveys of uh, pesticides. There are people who have been working on this. Thankfully, the good thing is in most of Kenya, our honey is completely safe and free of pesticides because we are using mostly natural systems. Honeybees are foraging on wildflowers. So we need to keep it that way. We need to keep the environment we have, which is so beautiful and clean, safe for bees. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Alfin Odwar uh, still have uh, a request that could you clear the air on crystallization of honey in relation to honey purity? Uh, there isn't a connection between purity necessarily and crystallization. Some honeys will naturally crystallize. It's really related to the nectar that the, that, uh, the bees collected. So certain nectars have much more dense sugars or different variations of sugar, glucose versus sucrose versus fructose. Bees will also, as I'm sure you've noticed, bees will go and collect uh, feed from rotting fruit. So if you have like a lot of ripening mangoes, you will sometimes see bees gathering on it. Bees will even go to animal dung. If you go to very dry areas, uh, where there's lack of water, you will see bees going to elephant dung to drink the moisture. So it all depends on where the bees have been foraging. Now, the question is, is some, are people mixing sugar to make honey? And that, that's different now. That's a, a process somebody will be doing, but that would require a lab to be able to tell that apart. Thank you. Uh, from Kitale Nature Conservancy, which is the best type of beehive if one is to start beekeeping in a conservancy? 
there, there's no perfect beehive for any particular conservancy or environment. The best thing is to talk to a local beekeeper. Go and find somebody who is successfully keeping bees in that area. Because if you're in a hot, dry area like northern Kenya or versus maybe a cooler habitat like in western Kenya or wetter areas, you might want to modify your style of beekeeping slightly. So the modern hives have the ability to put supers on them so you can separate the larvae and the colony from the, whack, the combs that contain the honey. So that's easier to harvest and easier on the bees. But each bee environment will have its own best way of keeping bees. In the hot, dry areas, bee hives need to be cooler and shaded. In the cooler areas, they need to have more, more sun, sunshine. Uh, log hives are better in certain areas or hollow hives because they are safer from honey badgers. So it all depends on which environment you're in. Thank you. Uh, from Barbara Ogori, insightful information, so educative. Thank you so much, Dr. Dino. Thank you very much. Uh, Elvira, uh, thank you very much, Dino. Encouraging people to plant a lot of flowering plants in their compounds. Best indigenous which? My compound is full of different bees. Obviously, I don't know the species. Thank you. Uh, from Chitro, great presentation. Thank you, Dino. I have one beehive. How many times a year would you recommend to harvest honey? And what is the best time of year to do it? Thank you. Uh, harvesting honey is really related to how healthy the colony is. Uh, what you should do is monitor your hive and don't harvest honey if there's only a little because the bees also need that honey to grow and become a bigger colony to produce more honey. So if you think about it, it's like a cow. If you milk it too much when it's young, it's not going to mature and have its calf grow up and it's not going to be able to produce enough milk for the calf. So you want to invest in your bees and make sure they grow to a certain size as a colony. So you keep monitoring it. And the best way to do this is to go take a course on beekeeping. Visit uh, the National Beekeeping Station or your local extension officer or talk to a local beekeeper and you'll learn a lot about how and when to harvest honey. But the most important thing as a beekeeper is developing that observation, keeping records, understanding your bees, watching them. Typically harvesting is done in dry land areas a few weeks after the peak flowering. So for example, when the acacias flower, within a few weeks after that, maybe a month or six weeks, you will have a nice amount of honey. So that's when you harvest it. But always make sure you do it in a way that is sensitive to the bees and sensitive to the environment. Thank you. Uh, from Zakaria Mutinda, how exactly do we st sterilize a previously wax moth infested beehive? Pesticides? any naturally recommended approaches? So the way to clean out by sterilizing, we don't use pesticides. If you use pesticides in a hive that will contaminate the hive and it will affect the bees. So the most critical thing you should do is cleaning it out. So scrubbing it clean, you could even wash it with a little bit of, uh, you know, a bit of vinegar, uh, just to totally clean it out, scrub it clean, dry it in the sun, and then set it up again. So don't, but uh, don't use pesticides or chemicals in the hive. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Vincent, citizen science is a very important way of getting better for scientific purposes. Is there a citizen science project on bees in Kenya? Thank you, yes. We, we have uh, many uh, people, naturalists, who are making observations of bees. And you can share those through uh, social media. You can write to Nature Kenya. You can write to us at the Insect Committee of Nature Kenya through insects.eanhs at gmail.com. Uh, uh, and you will have uh, a response from us. We don't have a direct citizen science project for monitoring bees, but you can, if you're around them, take pictures, share the pictures. You're welcome to write to us. Once we complete the book on the bees of East Africa, we hope that we can use that for many different people to engage with and learn to understand and appreciate the whole diversity of bees around them. Thank you very much. Uh, the last one from uh, Alfin Odwar. 
Thank you, Dr. Dino, for the responses. So I was wondering, what's the lead time for a hive to colonize bees, specifically in the arid and semi lands areas like Kajiado? Thank you, that's a good question. So most of the swarms appear with the rainy season and it's been difficult because it's been so dry across most of the country. So the key thing is to put up hives, make sure they are clean, that they are accessible to bees, that there's water, clean water available near the hive. You can use some of the traditional plants, including osimum or others, to smear inside the hive. That's uh, to help attract the honeybees. And just to be, uh, to, it's also a matter of luck. So in a place that has many other natural swarms, has good habitat, you should a swarm fairly quickly but the key thing is you can also go and talk to a beekeeper and and learn from them because there are also ways of dividing colonies and you, then you can establish that through actually getting a colony that's ready in a hive that way we'll get you a head start on the beekeeping okay, great i see uh more questions are coming in and uh, bernard gross have shared uh, the the, the email of uh, the Insects Committee of Nature Kenya. And also this is an opportunity to welcome uh, all the non-members uh, who are here, because this was an open forum, that we welcome you to our membership. We are an open membership society. Uh, we strive to save species, conserve sites and habitats, and uh, empower people to support nature. We welcome you uh, on board so that we walk the conservation journey together. Uh, John have uh, shared uh, our membership flyer and uh, it has all the details on uh, how you can uh, join and become a member of Nature Kenya. Uh, from Mother Mutiso, a bee colony has made a home in our kitchen chimney. How can we safely relocate them to an outdoor home? Uh, thank, thank you, Martha. If you have a bee, bees that have naturally come and swarmed into your home, the best thing is to find a local beekeeper to be able to come in. There are people who specialize in move, safely collecting those colonies and moving them because that of course is, it's, if, if it's honeybees and they can sting, you want to be able to move them. So you can put up a hive somewhere and get a local beekeeper to move them. Okay, thank you. Uh, from Jen, very informative. Thank you very much, Dr. Dino. What are some of uh, considerations for rearing specific type of bee? For instance, honeybees or uh, things stingless bee, not stainless. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. That's a great question. So you can do a lot. You can obviously with beekeeping with honeybees, but what you can do for solitary bees is very interesting. You can make a bee hotel and, and almost anyone, let me pull one down here. We have a little bee hotel right here. That's uh, a block of wood. And you can see it says bee hotel, rooms available, apply within. <laughs> and almost all of these, you see the holes in the wood, They're, they are now occupied. Most of them are occupied by leaf cutter bees that have come in and now that the rains have started, they'll start hatching out. So you can create using old pieces of reeds or a block of an old wood or just leaving some habitat. And if you look at the, the book that we've produced on pollinators, it has some uh, practical ways of building your own bee hotel. And we can even email us and we can share that information with you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh... For that. Uh, another one from Gregory, very informative, sir. Thank you. What is the best time to install hives and harvest honey in Kenya? Thank you. There, there's no perfect time. It depends on the habitat you're in. So the best thing is usually, usually around the rainy season when there's been good flowering, but talk to a local beekeeper or visit a beekeeping association or go to the National Beekeeping Station and learn from them because there are different zones in the country that have different times. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last one from uh, Dominic. Good, interesting. Have you ever heard of any myths about beekeeping, bee occupation and so on? 
Thank you. Yes, there's so many different stories about bees. And I actually encourage everybody participating to go and go and talk to the Waze in your community and collect those stories because everyone has stories of how they ran away from bees or they learned from bees or they got stung when they were trying to get some honey. But there's some really wonderful stories and um, information, traditional knowledge. So amongst the people in Southern Africa, the hunter-gatherer community, they believe that amongst the San, the human origin was very much related to the bee and the bee was involved in when the people were being created, the bee and the honeybee and the praying mantis were two of the key creatures that had already been created that helped humans come into existence. So that's, that's one of those amazing stories about bees. The other amazing thing with honeybees is if you go to parts of Tanzania or even parts of Northern Kenya, you will find very ancient art, rock art engraving and painting that are in caves and rock shelters that depict people harvesting or interacting with, with bees. And that it goes back thousands and thousands of years. So humans and honeybees have an ancient relationship in East Africa, and we, we need to make sure we understand it better and we learn more about it. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Jane, thank you for the demo. Interesting, we can also have the hotel. <laughs> 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 okay, great. So uh, for more of our conservation work, you can uh, visit our website, which I've shared uh, in the chat box, www.naturekenya.org. Aha, uh -huh. John Dyre, Nyandarwa beekeepers, our biggest problem is climate change or whether it has affected our production. That's, that's a concern. Okay, so um, we have come to the end of uh, all the questions that was raised through our chat box. Maybe if you, you have any question that you would like to ask, you can uh, raise your hand, you unmute yourself, and then uh, you can uh, raise it through the platform here. I see we still have some few minutes before the session comes to an end. So the floor is open. You can raise up your hand and then we go in that order. You can ask, actually interact with Dr. Dino direct. This is an opportunity. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Dino. Okay, my question is, we actually found a, a colony of uh, bees flying away with a large number and find them in a certain tree, just relaxing. Is there any cause that has caused them to come out from where they used to be? Thank you, Jeff. That's a very important question and observation. So we often will see bees making a, a cluster in a tree or sometimes even on a building because what that is is now that's a swarm who have left their colony so remember when the young queen returns the colony will split splits into half and half of them swarm to look for a new place to live but it might take them some days to find a new place so what has happened there is that swarm are clustering around that queen to protect her from that colony now that's hanging in a tree they are going to go out they send scouts out to look for a new house, for where are they going to live, whether it's a natural area or a new hive. And those scout bees go out and then they come back and they inform the others. And what is amazing about this process is it's very democratic. So bees practice democracy just like we do. And each bee gets one vote and they go out and they find a good place and they come back and they tell the other bees. But the difference between bees is they don't vote for different parties. They wait until everybody has a consensus and then they'll go to the new place to live. So when we see a swarm in a tree, we should just leave it alone because they are now using that moment to do their voting to look for a new place to live. Okay, thank you for that. Another question is that sometimes you find a bee on a flower. Do they visit each and every flower that they erupted in a, an ecosystem? Thanks, Jeff. That's a good question. No, bees visit many different flowers, but they don't visit all the flowers. Honeybees visit about 20 to 
30% of the flowers and different flowers have different adaptations for bees. So for example, there are certain flowers like acacia flowers, which are very open and many different bees can access them, both honeybees and other species. There are some flowers that are very specialized that bees can't access as easily. And those might have evolved with moths or butterflies or sunbirds, but in an, most ecosystems for the generalized flowers, those are the ones that the bees are visiting. But there are also some specialized flowers that have co-evolved with bees. So for example, legumes, legumes like the crotolaria, the indigofera, some of the crops that we are growing that are legumes, the pea flowers, the bean flowers, these have a specialized pollination system with bees. Thank you. Wow, okay, I've not understood. Okay, Jeff, go ahead. Okay, I was asking concerning the sun harvesting, how does it affect the, the decline of bees in an ecosystem? So many of the bees that we showed you the pictures of, they are solitary bees, they are ground nesting and they like to nest in sandy areas. They actually like sandy soil because it's warmer and they are able to dig their nests more easily in that soil. So when, when those areas are harvested, it's basically destroying the nesting sites for the solitary bees. Okay, my question again is in, the, in some years to come, Will we, will we face the decline of bees or will we have an increase on them? That depends on what you and I and all of us do. If we protect habitats and we look after them like you are doing in, in your area, then we will continue to have a lot of diversity of bees. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jeff, for those uh, very, very uh, well-designed questions. Uh, Jeff, where are you from? Uh, maybe you're reaching us from which part of the country? Okay, I'm from Asaimara. Oh, great. Working, you, in a conservation, working in a conservation area called Marasiana. So that's where I'm working from. Ah, good. Always uh, nice to hear that uh, we also have, uh, you know, representatives from uh, Marasiana who have joined us today for this uh, interactive session. Uh, in the chat box, I, Austin is asking, did Dr. Dino mention a, a, a new book on peace of East Africa? When will it be available? Uh, we're, we're working on it at the moment. We hope it will be available by the end of the year. So towards, towards November, start looking out for it. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Felicity Mecha, uh, you raised your hand. You can uh, unmute yourself and uh, you raise your concern. Oh, hi. Hi, Dino. This was very informative. Thank you. Um, my, my biggest question is that I'm based in Kajiado, but I live, um, I live in a populated area and I wanted to do beekeeping, but uh, my advisor told me that I need to go further from where people live but I live in a quarter acre piece of land. So I don't understand why that wouldn't be sufficient to have bees. Uh, th thank you, Felicity. Yes, it's a challenge if there are a lot of people around having honeybees will be a danger to other people because you don't, if somebody disturbs that hive uh, in a densely populated area, there are ways of doing it, but it has to be done sensitively. But if you're interested in just protecting the diversity of bees, you know, you can put up a bee hotel. These solitary bees are, are not going to attack anyone. And so they, they can survive even in those areas. So we can, we can send you the information from Nature Kenya on how to build a bee hotel. Uh, but for beekeeping, it's better to do it in an area that has fewer people because otherwise the bees might sting somebody and then you don't want to be held responsible for that. So it's important to balance beekeeping as well with, but any small garden can have a bee hotel in it. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Juliet, wow, interesting and very educative. Thanks, uh, Dr. Dino. Uh, from Martin Kiama, this is very informative. Thank you, Dr. Dino and the organizing team. Okay, so is there anyone who still has uh, a burning question before we bring the session to an end? I think we still have some few, few minutes. 
Yes, Bruno, you can unmute and uh, let us know. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Dino, it was very, uh, very interesting what you came with. I, I have just a question. I, I have beehives here in Karen. And uh, we are moving to Manzoni into a green area. Do you see uh, that I will have a problems moving these beehives 70, 80 kilometers from the place where they are now? Thank you, Bruno. Uh, you can move bees. The key thing is I would try and I would consult a professional beekeeper to help with the moving. But the most important thing is when you move them. Because Ka this in K Karen is fairly green and has a lot of flowers most of the year. Manzoni can be drier. So it's to move them when up there's been good rain and good flowering, and then making sure they have enough uh, water. So when you move them, you might want to provide extra water in Manzoni because it's hotter and drier. And <clears throat> moving them, making sure they're not going from a cooler place to a warmer place, keeping them under some kind of shade will be important as well. The bees might still react. You might have a few you know, that abscond from the hives, but they will probably come back at some point as well. And there's lots of swarms down in Manzoni as well. So if you put up hives there as well, they should be filled with bees pretty quickly. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bruno, for the question. Uh, in the chat box, uh, Vivian Nandoka from uh, the library uh, to Dr. Dino, we provide ISBNs for books in case you need one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another one from John Daire, Nyandarwa beekeepers bees living near town are feeding on fruits instead of flowers. This giving us different tastes of honey. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't think that I have um, actually closed out on anyone. Is there anyone with still a burning question? We have uh, like two minutes to go before we bring it to an end. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, it has really been a very, very interactive session. And thank you very much uh, to Dr. Dino Martins. It has been a very, very interesting tour of the world of bees. We have really uh, been fed with a lot of information. And I think uh, even me personally, I'm now a changed person and I really have very positive perception towards bees. I've really learned a lot. Thank you very much uh, for taking us through. Still uh, to welcome each and every one of you who is a non-member to join us uh, in Nature Kenya. Uh, the membership flyer has been shared in the chat box. And also for more of um, Dr. Dino's books, we have them in uh, Nature Kenya uh, office in our shop here. You can uh, visit our online shop in the website. We have displayed everything in there. You can always uh, purchase through that site, or you can walk into our membership office, which is situated at um, Nairobi National Museum grounds. We are right there and uh, we welcome you and uh, we look forward to seeing you join Nature Kenya. Even uh, the new book for Dino Martins that uh, he will be releasing uh, in a very short time to come, it will be uploaded into our website, our, our online shop, and you will be able to check in from there. You can always purchase from there. So thank you very much, each and everyone. It has been uh, great having you on board and uh, I really wish you a lovely B weekend. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> now we can leave at our own pleasure. Thank you.